Welcome to Exposure on Writing in Prison. My name is Kate Meissner. I am the Prison and Justice Writing Program Director at PEN America, and I'm so happy to see you all here at this World Voices Festival event. So, without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome our amazing readers who have stepped in for the writers that can't be here to bring their work to you, and I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. this on stage. I don't know yet. <laughs> Welcome to Exposure on Writing in Prison. My name is Kate Meissner. I am the Prison and Justice Writing Program Director at PEN America, and I'm so happy to see you all here at this World Voices Festival event. You all have a packet, yes? You don't have to read along. Don't worry. I'm just making sure everybody got one. This is for you to take home. There are excerpts in here of the amazing work you're gonna see tonight. I'm so proud of what we got to do this year. Typically in the World Voices Festival over the years, it's our 15th year of doing the World Voices Festival, our program has had a reading that dips into our archives, so work that's already been written and won an award in our Prison Writing Awards and we bring it to life and it's wonderful and great, but this year, when we found out that the theme was open secrets and really looking at the border, the dissolving border between public and private lives, in our world, we thought, well, our writers in prison know a thing about the difference between public and private in terms of their creative life, and probably have a lot to say about it. So we commissioned a series of some of our most active writers to respond directly to this theme with brand new original works that have never been seen by anybody yet, and you're the first. Mo, you're so good, just keep it coming. <laughs> Absolutely. As you might imagine, Obviously, our writers can't be here today because they're in prison. So your feedback is really important. We send back uh, packets that show photographs and letters and an uh, overview of what the show was like and the program with their work and their bio and their photo and these cards on your chair. We invite you during the show, after the show, whichever, to write a message or a response to what you saw tonight and drop it right in our mailbox on the stage on your way out. And this is... Um, mail that we get on our desk every day. So all of our work comes through the mail. So this is our presencing too of all the folks that we work with. Yeah. So, without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome our amazing readers who have stepped in for the writers that can't be here to bring their work to you. And I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. If a tree falls, crash in the woods, and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? If not, how lonely for the tree? Leaves whispering lonely words like only and please hear me? My thoughts remain in the stars, no voice. I remain behind bars for a choice to abandon myself to the wild, the foul, now branded like the X on my file. I am an ex-offender. Ship fourth class mail from the public defender. I am an ex-citizen. Recidivism contrary tell. Ex-con expected to fail. But I fly in the face of expectations. Embrace the eyes against me. The harder I'm pressed, the sweeter the victory. I now understand that the greatest need in humanity is simply to be heard. The need of a child is to be heard. The need of a victim is to be heard. The need of a poet is to be heard. 
Why does the caged bird sing? To be heard. I will be heard. Because my need for you to hear me is deeper than the tendency of society to ignore me. Out of sight, out of my, my, my mind, with this longing just to be heard. And you have, and you have it in your power, you see, to give me the greatest gift to me, greater than gold or sympathy. In fact, you're giving it to me now. This strange and beautiful irony, how? By drinking these words with your eyes. You are quenching my thirst to be realized. I am not asking to be coddled, but this message in a bottle <clears throat> is my heart laid bare, unprotected. Floor of Phoenix for a moment, resurrected. Reborn in a moment. You don't fear me. If you hear me, put your ears to the bars. Hear my mind. Whisper down from the stars. Just to lend me your ear is to give me the world. To let flaming phoenix wings unfurl. See this miracle before you, clearly. I will give you my heart if only you will hear me. Okay, now I did this and I don't know how to put it back in. I try to learn something new every day. Irish soda bread, one pound of flour, one tablespoon of baking soda, one tablespoon of salt, three-fourths cups of buttermilk. A photon means a packet of radiation. The western part of Lake Huron is polluted with algae. Sussurus means a whispering or rustling sound. Yesterday, I spoke to Stephanie, who lives a few doors down the hall. I learned about her mother. One, was in a wheelchair because she had a bad hip and fibromyalgia. Two was watching not only Stephanie's 10-year-old son, but also his three cousins, all under the age of four, because their mother is in treatment. I learned that Stephanie's husband has black and gray tattoos, all gotten while in prison, that covers his entire upper torso, from his chin to his belt level, and mostly depict demons. He is now in Texas and will be on parole until August. I asked her if she likes tattoos. She did. Stephanie is planning on going back to Texas once she is out of prison. And that's in December. I don't know why she's here. I don't share much of my own life with others. But then, my husband is not in prison and has no tattoos. And we don't have children. Just two half Siamese cats that are siblings and poor mousers. My home life lacks drama. In Ojibwe, the world for old, old woman means one that holds things together. It is a myth that MSG, a flavor enhancer, is bad for your health. The endangered pangolin is only found in Africa and Asia, and it looks like a walking pine cone. Millie Benson was the ghostwriter for Carolyn Keene and wrote most of the Nancy Drew series. I play cribbage with a petite woman who was a big drug dealer. She started using coke at the age of 12 and as a teen stole thousands of dollars in quarters by breaking into car wash money boxes. She's a heavy stakes casino regular. Her true vice is gambling. I work out with a sex offender. She slept with a 15 year old kid who mowed her lawn. That's a seven year offense. Kara stole a car. Christy embezzled, Misty assaulted with a knife. TJ killed her unborn child in an automobile accident while she was driving drunk. Gina held up in a house surrounded by the sheriff's department while threatening to kill herself with a loaded shotgun because she believes she had just killed her two youngest children. Not true. Isabel killed her abusive husband. I don't know how. I don't want to know. I never ask why people are here. It's none of my business. I stay away from people that try to pry into other people's crimes. I like to hear people's backstories, though, where they're from and what they like to do as a kid or in the past. One weekend, while walking in line on my way to the dining room, a very loose, loose term for chow hall, or what I refer to as the hit and miss because the food is inconsistently prepared, I follow a friend, again, loosely defined. She was in my playwriting class who has a red swastika that shows its top half, just above the back of her t-shirt neckline. What in the world 
would possess someone, anyone, to permanently mark themselves with a prominent sign of universal hate. I felt I could finally ask her because of our shared classes. The aforementioned playwriting, one where she wrote about a hippie couple in the 60s with Bonnie and Clyde tendencies who were running away from the police. When I say running, I mean motorcycling and a poetry class, lyric poetry, where her work seemed relationship-based. She didn't appear to be a racist or anti-Semitic or mean-spirited. Actually, she smiled a lot. She was kind. I asked her about her tattoo. She said, I was different then. I've changed. I don't know what I learned from that conversation, but I thought about it all afternoon. Once a white supremacist, always a white supremacist? Was she a fascist? Fascist Is she a fascist? Was she a Nazi? Nazi? Is she a Nazi? Do I give Nazis more respect if I capitalize the word Nazi? The woman with the red swastika went to boot camp and now is gone. I guess I'll never really know. I do know she likes to draw goddesses and moons. I let go of my judgment. That is my lesson. I am surrounded by bad choices, bad situations, addiction. I try to figure out what I'm supposed to be learning within this college of disaster. I document what I see because I don't know what else to do with all that surrounds me. Hello. This poem is seven sections. Each section is a different reflection on a part of the cell. Each section has vignettes reflecting on both the inside and the outside world. Section one, bars. My good friend noosed himself rigid around his bars. Fifteen, on the day a jury of his peers damned his pu pub pubescent black body to petrify a hundred plus years. How he must have pined for lost time lonely in his cell, his whole skin a scowl until the bars spelled a ritual for release. How many times have I slammed these iron Bars shut, locking myself in. How many clenched hands have repeated the same clutched slide lock? Did the metal maker mold the kennel door knowing for the occupant it would be a daily DIY caging? When I reach through the bars and bring nothing back, am I wrong to reach again and again? Bars, what keep me from? Two, cell floor. A slab of concrete coated, a gray blue dark like a sky pissed off, the kind of color a depressed body patinas into, a shade I've heard called corpse gray. It's scuffed, bubbled, pockmarked like a lunar landscape, always cold. Its layered history exposed through erosion from pacing feet and feet and feet and feet and black under the gray, blue, pale gray, under the black, scab green, under that. I spent a summer in segregation, a brutal summer of heat and stifle Humidity that lounged its sticky self into cells with no fans, no air conditioning, no open windows, the sink water lukewarm, stripped down to my boxers, glistening like glass just blown. I felt cool relief against the soles of my naked feet. The next few weeks, I spent every minute as far under the heat as I could get sprawled across the narrow mattress I had laid on the floor. Three, toilet. No toilet seats or lids. 
There's the metal push button in lieu of a flush handle jutting from the wall two inches above the toilet. The toilet is two feet from where my head lies on a plastic wrapped pillow every night, eight inches from the side of the desk, so my flanky frame must sit sideways over the bowl, maneuver my hips, chest to the left, lean forward slightly and hike my knees and hike my knees up until tippy toed chins smashed against the desk edge. Wiping requires its own awkward negotiations. Mine is like the white porcelain toilet found in most homes. It's always cool, slick surface, goosebumps my bare flesh, just like the one at my old house on Southgate Drive. As a kid, I laid down strips of toilet paper across the toilet's lip to protect my backside from its chilled shock. Out of habit, I practiced the same my first few years in prison until I re realized I would never call this place home. In the summer of 2010, a construction worker punctured the prison's sewer pipe. No toilet could flush for two days. That's 280 meta bolisms in each housing unit. That's five housing units. That's 1,400 unflushed toilets with two days worth of a brew of waste boiling in the dry heat for two days. We tried to hold in what clenched our guts when our bodies began to sweat and shake and pang from restraint out of options. We tried to mask what came out with liquid soap. That's, that's fucked up. Shampoo, lotion, detergent clenching chemicals and baby powder for closet. A five foot by two foot by one and a half metal rectangle with a single shelf I section into piles of six impeccably folded white t-shirts, six pairs of white socks, six white boxers, and two gray sweaters below. This shelf stacked from the flower, from the floor up are art papers and sketch pads, plastic bowls brimmed with tubes of watercolor, and oil paints, brushes, canvas, boxes of drawing charcoal, a row of collected letters from fickled loved ones I'm too afraid to throw away. I have filled this closet with meaning. I keep its door closed almost always, open only in brief seconds of necessity. Everyone knows closed means safe. If a tornado threatens, the closet is where I made to hunch and wonder if this is my unmarked tomb. There are monkeys in my closet, I used to tell dad. Not the curious George type, but the sinister frothing at the fanged mouth, monkeys of childhood nightmares. During daylight hours, straddling my brother's broad shoulders, I would swing my aluminum t-ball bat. Once dad slid the closet door open, eyes clamped shut, as I failed at t-shirts and jeans hung limp and innocent on hangers, I imagined those muffled wallops were bat against monkey belt. Today, those closet monsters are alive all around me, taking the form of prison-garbed bodies. The penitentiary is a closet crammed, and I am a hatless, and I am hatless, and my eyes are open, and I am one of them. Five, desk. I have books. Books stacked horizontal to bookend the books road vertically, spines out, so I can see the beautiful names of poets and artists in this one behemoth called a poet's glossary. That is sort of esoter uh, esoter esoteric accent and intimidating, 
but goddamn, if I haven't dog-eared its dense pages with eager hands. A 15-inch flat screen reveals the outside world. Is my, in case I get out of lifeline, lest I enter society too far gone for my 2002 departure, that I trade one prison for another. I trade, I watch a war's worth of bodies made into breaking news at school nightclub. I watch a war's worth of bodies made into breaking news at a school, nightclub, church, restaurant, mall, office, street, corner, and think maybe the stone wall dividing me from a nation divided keeps me safe. I have hunched over this sacred dented desk under my television's dull glow and emptied bick by bick onto letters that never receive a reply. Six, what these walls say, walls, stack was here, young player gang, north side, south side, east side, west side, the devil made me do it, Jesus saves, fuck, the police, Fuck the world. Fuck you, fuck. What these walls can't say. Remember that time you tenderized your knuckles bloody against my mask? The time you gorilla pounded me until fatigued? I am not your enemy. I am a wall by nature. I am immovable. On the wall, my bed is bolted to a three foot by three foot block painted black, the designated area for pictures. Nothing allowed on the wall outside the block's boundaries. That's the rule. That's the way even photos of loved ones are confined, policed by perimeters and policies. An aged father, siblings growing up, nieces and nephews I've never met, an auntie I call mom, a wife I call salvation, all collage, every inch of it black. My two younger brothers and I share a bunk bed in a bedroom the size of two cells when I was 11. Our third apartment is three years. Another cramped space, another attempt at new memories. On one wall opposite my bottom bunk, the previous owners had painted a child's jungle mural. When I could not help the want to be somewhere else, I lay down. Escape into the two bright greens, unrealistic trees, cartoon beast, and pretend it's fiction as a better reality. Most nights now, my cell, cellar, dark, I lie on my right side, inches from the wall, the wall breathing my back, breathing my breath back at me. I see the mural, I repaint it with faces of family, with patchy colors of memory and memoirs missed, I pretend nothing is wrong. Seven, bed. A stiff neoprene foam mattress, plastic coated, on top of a six foot long, two and a half foot wide, sheet of metal bolted to the wall. If this were my coffin, they would need to saw my feet off to make me fit. I have taught myself to sleep on my back. I have never used the term bedroom here. I have not relaxed my hardened body into peaceful slumber here. I have not stretched myself into a satisfying waking here. I have not next to the love of my life or made love here. I have not folded my limbs into a question mark at the bedges ed and prayed and prayed and prayed for forgiveness here. Thank you.
I can't tell you what the railroad is, but I can tell you why it exists. I used to send my writing out masked as correspondence. Articles, essays, and manuscripts that I broke down into tiny letter-sized installments and mailed. I received confiscation notices that read, trying to make profit from writing, and third-party communication, whatever that is supposed to mean. But not all the writing was confiscated, and I numbered the missives so when one or more turned up missing, I could reproduce them. When I won a national award for an exhaustive personal piece I wrote about the experiences of long-term solitary confinement, the prison sent me a confiscation notice that read, offenders are not authorized to enter sweepstakes or contests of any type. The notice was, of course, a monition not to write, as well as notification that I couldn't have the award letter nor the check for the nominal prize money that accompanied it. The prison redoubled its efforts to not let my writing out after that or writing-related correspondence in. I often don't receive confiscation notices now, so I had no idea that Francine Prose read my work on stage in New York City until two years after she did it. I didn't know Juno Diaz and rapper Talib Kweli read my work at a public event and released a podcast until more than a year later when a journalist perchance asked me, do you know I didn't know? My writing was part of a prison diary exhibit at the Anne Frank Center in New York, or that newspapers across the country published writing from the diary until someone transferred into the prison from another state and showed me a newspaper clipping that he had brought with him. When my writing does make it out of the prison and an editor mails it back in published form, I still receive confiscation notices. Most often the notices read, quote, the writing presents a threat to the safety of the facilities and or inciting language. The most ridiculous notice came in response to an article I wrote about the travails of an autistic prisoner behind the walls. That one read, quote, writing portrays staff as unprofessional. The article wasn't about staff at all. And there's the confiscation notice for the book I wrote, which reads, quote, the way the writing describes staff, it would drive the tensions between staff and offenders up, putting staff and offenders in harm's way, which is really just correctional jargon for, yeah, we are unprofessional. <laughs> the notices are system-wide, are a system-wide ban which means any prisoner in the state caught with a copy of my book or a previously restricted article will have time added to his or her sentence or be taken to the whole, including me. It doesn't help that I am unable to acquit myself of the hope that at some point the prison will capitulate and simply allow me to write. Sometimes I talk myself into believing there's still a chance an article or essay I mail will make it out of the prison, even though I know better. I dropped an envelope through the slot atop the steel box bolted into the concrete floor at the cell house entrance two days ago. The box looks like what I imagine a mailbox in the free world might look like, but it isn't a free world mailbox. This morning, a guard brought a notice to my cell that the prison confiscated the envelope. The notice reads, quote, writing an article with no approval from the superintendent. But there is no policy or process for prisoners to ask the superintendent whether or not they can write. The confiscation notice doesn't comport with any express rule barring me from writing. There is none. Yet the notice isn't incidental or isolated vagary of the institution. Neither is it the unsupported caprice of any individual agent's action within the institution. 
every piece of writing the prison has confiscated from me prosecutes a fundamental tenet of prison in the US, particularly the peculiarly American institution of mass incarceration. That is, the pathological and historically embedded idea that prisoners are not to have control of any facet of the institution, including narration of their own context or experience within it. Understanding why the railroad exists is to know that the strategy of denying people the right to define their context or narrate their experience within an institution has a history in this country that predates incarceration. Railroad isn't a happenstance term like the covert railway along which slaves and their narratives passed into the free world before us, laying a network of rails that lead out from behind the walls that enclose mass incarceration violates what the state delineates as law. Consequently, participation in the railroad is fraught with danger and makes your existence in prison more harried and precarious than if you were a gang leader, drug dealer, or high-level escape risk. The institution considers you a greater threat, yet criminal intent plays no role. The railroad is merely visceral rejection of the idea that there are no stories behind these walls other than the ones narrated by the state. No, I can't tell you what the railroad is, how its rails are laid, who's involved, or how it works. It may be the only thing about prison I can't, won't write about, because writing about it would compromise its existence, and without it, I wouldn't be able to write. Just know that these words aren't an exception. They didn't enjoy the luxury, privilege, or security of a mailbox in the free world. Prison hasn't yet surrendered. If not for the rails, you wouldn't be reading this. Censorship didn't exist in my world until I came to prison. They control who we call, who we write, who we visit with, even who we associate with, what we read, what we see, what we draw, and especially what we write. An incarcerated writer trying to correspond with my writing mentor, I have to work with our prison's department, and this refuses to forward my poems to my mentor because it contained the term, my mentor never received it. No discussion, appeal, or due process. They, it has done this to me three different works of mine so far. Just writing this poem could get me in trouble. Even though I won't use the word or write about, or use my thesaurus to express my written joy and continue to work with my mentor. I self-censor, edit my words, reenact revolutionary and overly creative ideas, sanitize and clean it up, hoping to make it past the word police guarding my words from the outside world. Because if I can't somehow get this by through and around, it'd be nothing more than Handwritten scribbles stuck behind bars in my writer's notebook. Uh -oh. Every time a prisoner submits their writing into the public sphere, they are subjecting themselves to an audience who can easily look them up and be told a prosecutor's version of a story 
true or untrue, about their conviction. This is in juxtaposition to all a prisoner desires, to put the past behind them, to lay low and quietly merge back into society, to reconnect with those they love in fresh circumstances. Writing as a prisoner ties their name to the label of felon. A prisoner must ask themselves, am I willing to put myself out there, to possibly be talked about again, to be judged, again, and more importantly, is this story slash play slash poem slash idea worth my vulnerability? Will people listen or judge? While all artists slash writers question the value of their work and wonder who is viewing it and how it is being perceived, a prisoner who is an artist or who writes always carries the added burden of having to apologize for their past or for a piece of their past or for one afternoon of their past, or for one minute of their past. Mass incarceration is a war. Mass incarceration is war. Mass incarceration is war, and I'm a reporter on the front line. I don't want to be here, but I am here, surrounded by struggle, vulnerability, anger, grief, and confusion. I listen and ask questions that sometimes I wish I hadn't, because often the story behind the time is long, sad, and painful. I keep asking. I keep asking because, I keep asking because every person is important and deserves to tell their story. It empowers people to be heard. And that is why it is worth the risk for me to elbow my way into the written conversation of the world beyond the wall. Again today, I watched breaking news of yet another data breach. This latest breach involved the weather app and is similar to what happened to your social media, banking and wearable devices that track your comings and goings. The same indignity befell your stolen social security numbers, Pinterest accounts and online habits, data now ripe for the picking by criminals and trolls, or reading to fulfill a multitude of harmless curiosities. I watch from society's farthest margins, violations against your pri rights to privacy and your perfunctory outrage that within days will subside until the next violation. I watch this envious of your access to these resources and experiences, but also for want of similar exposure of my own personal data, my interests, rehabilitative successes and reentry goals that comprise my activities in prison, data that would expose who I am compared to who I was, what I've done to change and what I'm continuing to do. Your concerns, however justified, are the kind of airing that not all, but many prisoners are clamoring for. Through every letter home or to a reporter, essay or poetry submission, email, birthday or thank you card, sent with the off chance hope its sentiments will be leaked beyond its intended recipient or shared with someone else. For therein lies our unique voices and how we network by putting ourselves out there. For the imprisoned, your violations of privacy and data breaches are an attractive alternative and analogous of transparency. The potential gains from such exposures far outweigh the risks of renewed public scorn. We want our personal data released into the public sphere. In many ways, it already is. Much about us is public information, starting with our arrest and the blurb of history that usually follows. But once transferred to prison, our narratives lapse into a shroud of privacy. Despite the systemic suppression of our voices, we fill in the lapses where we can many of which lie within our prison records. In Virginia, they lie within CORUS, the Correctional Information System, an extensive database that includes our institutional adjustment, disciplinary infractions, vocational training, and other developmental activities, risk assessments, and observational reports by correctional staff and officers. 
Public access to the cache of data in course would fundamentally change the public perception of prisoners. Where every stakeholder, victims, judges, prosecutors, and neighbors, our families, advocates, and friends had access to our prison records, its data would hold all of us accountable, stakeholders and prisoners alike. Public access to courts would further substantiate evidence-based practices and prison reforms. It would affirm our personal endeavors toward, towards reformation and either refute or corroborate everything we've been writing in our letters and telling our families over the phone. It would bolster your trust in us and validate the sacrifices of our loved ones and that their hopes in us are not misplaced. No file, no matter how comprehensive, can replace the long and frank conversations we prisoners want to have. Nor should these conversations and everything we share in them go uncorroborated. Within the two data sets lie our critical paths, all the wrong and right turns we've taken throughout this ordeal. When used together, they contextualize our footprints, the imprints made years ago, as well as the impressions we're making today. Our paths contain endeavors and digital footprints we want you to track so that hopefully, one day, you'll be encouraged by what you see and can say, I see where he's going. Can I ask you all for a little bit of help for this piece here? Yeah. All right, so let's get our voices activated as a collective. This is not part of the thing yet, but uh, if I said, yeah. yeah. Wow, that was good. Now we have a special prompt, which Lisa uh, will show and demonstrate when we say the word. Shit. All right, let's try that one more time. One, two, three. This sign will appear prominently during the piece. You guys sound great. Here we go. <laughs> Prison's supposed to be a time and place to get your shit together. But thieves try to take your shit. shit. Bullies give you shit. shit. Mouth off to the wrong guy and you're in deep shit. shit. You can't take a shit, shit. in private. All our personal Shit has to fit in two bins. Most inmates don't give a shit about nothing except themselves. Easy to forget little shit like signing in. Everyone knows each other's shit. Shitty mattresses make it hard to sleep worth a shit. If you don't fight, you're a chicken shit. They feed us shit. It's difficult to get shit done. OGs walking around like they're king shit. Most days we feel like shit. Some days we look like shit. The system treats us like shit. Then excretes us out the door. Expecting us to clean up our act and live like a normal human being. That's bullshit. Four, what are your fears when people from the outside world read your work? Any advice on what audiences should bring to the reading? What to put aside when reading? My fear of judgment encompasses public opinion. Everyone's crime is public record. I was pregnant. 19, when I killed my fiance. I'm pro-life, I don't believe in abortion as a birth control. It was my first pregnancy and I was facing life imprisonment. Still, some people felt I had no regard for human life to have had an abortion. I'd been horribly abused as a child and then adopted into a good home. I couldn't put our child through that uncertainty in addition to killing his dad. I am a murderer, but also a Christian. Biblically, David was a premeditated murderer to get Bathsheba. Moses and Paul were also murderers my creator redeemed. 
I have assaulted people while in prison and I lived a hand-to-mouth existence. What if no one understands the downward spiral, positive changes, and hope for freedom? Even if paroled, I'll never be finished accounting for my crime with explanations to landlords, employers, and a significant other. Six, how has being incarcerated affected your writing rituals or style? Does less privacy in living space have an impact on creative expression? Prior to coming to prison and discovering who I am, I have always been misunderstood. I am a pre-op trans male. It's too much to explain to every roommate. Additionally, I'd face the worries that as a male trapped in a woman's body, females think I'd ogle them. Not every woman is a turn on. No privacy has meant many distractions from balancing life and creative expression. It can be like trying to study at a bus station or living in a chicken coop. It's difficult to formulate thoughts when your bunkie is rude and flatulent. Five, writing in prison can often be exposing. How do you deal with the heightened risk of writing while incarcerated? I have been incarcerated 32 consecutive years in three states, six prisons, and turned down by the parole board four times on this life sentence for killing my fiance. Writing in prison is exposing because it is a microcosm society. High profile cases are readily discussed. Your writings are easily interpreted into situations of your surroundings. Everyone knows, without naming names, the woman that hung herself because her lover in the prison was going back to her ex. Many times I have written things barred from being sent out due to inflammatory, inciting language. Yet I haven't asked anyone to do anything. I have just informed people of situations. Writing what I think or feel even momentarily, has cost me parole. I have been called a whistleblower, rat, and or snitch reporting excessive violent incidents. You literally can't afford a bad day. Administrators don't take kindly to you bashing their system, even though it's not a personal commentary on any particular person. Let's not forget that you are at an officer's mercy for rule violations who may write their own rendition of events. It is a struggle to write when you write under the threat of Miranda, that everything you say can and will be held against you, even if you're not acting as a criminal, but a journalist of your own life. I've come to terms with the fact that I will not be able to write a book unless commissioned, and it gets sent out chapter by chapter, sometimes page by page. I don't know how I'm going to survive. I don't know how I'm going to make a living. I don't know if I'll get over these hurdles. I don't know. So I write. I write about the perceived injustices. I write kites to try to make prison a better place. I write to senators and popes and commissioners and wardens. I write to express my fears and kindle my hopes. I write to all the letters of the alphabet, soup, A, C, L, U, D, O, J, L, A, M, P, O, H, S, M, S, O, P, L, L, S, P, E, T, C. Most of the time, I'm ignored, but I don't give up. I write to survive. I am a survivor. Yeah. The man. It's important that I have an audience for my work inside prison to keep me honest, true, to our experiences and emotions. They are my gatekeepers, ensuring that I don't go too hard, don't come off too soft, don't add too much water for the sensitive palates of the people. I give it to you, society, the taxpayers, the deal makers, the game changers, as the world has given it to us, 
prisoners, raw and uncut. It's imperative that I have an outside audience for my work, our work, so that the parents and children can communicate. The man. I know you don't want to claim us, but we prisoners, the robbers and murderers, the falsely convicted and framed are all one and the same. Your bastard children, products of your society, foster children within your prison industrial complex, nightmares within the American dream. The man. You readers, witnesses to our personal narratives are our torchbearers, our historians, the advocates or adversaries who can liberate us like the Gena Six or condemn us like Stanley Tukey Williams. You hold the keys to release the actual innocent, to make sure that the cry for justice is not silenced by the bricks and barbed wire. The man. My hand trembles on the tremendous responsibilities to being that writer, that voice, that must give sight to your eyes of the unseen injustices, brutalities, sicknesses, and mistakes. The man. I must reach beyond state lines, political parties, financial barriers, and fears to touch your hearts, caress them enough to activate their voices, to move you from thrill-seeking voyeurism, a private peeking at the taboo, to outraged witnesses, outspoken critics, and ultimately catal catalysts to change. Catalysts to change. Catalysts to change. The man. I must be open and honest with you. Escape my fears of criticism and condemnation to show you the dark sides of humanity. I can't cut corners. I can't sugarcoat my crimes or crimes, our crimes, if I ever wish credibility with you. The man. If I ever wish you to set aside your skepticism, Bring to my confessions an open mind and belief that truth can come from the convicted and condemned. I must own up to my own shortcomings. I must bypass excuses and sob stories. I must move past pains with the hope that if I show you mine, you will show me yours. With the prayers that an open mind will morph into a heart of, compa of compassion, mercy maybe for a drug dealing gangbanger, a convicted killer who's never killed anyone. The man. The lack of privacy on the obscene island that I've been exiled to has made me braver and bolder. It had robbed me of the modesty and stolen all my secrets, so I move smoothly from the darkness to light, callously, blatantly displaying my, ble my blemishes. I dare the cowards, the cover-ups, the makeup artists to criticize my imperfections while shielding their own, challenging him without flaws to cast the first stone. It is the seclusion, the roaring silence of solitude, the, des the desolation of the darkness gives power to my pen, the way to my words, for I have tread the pebbled pothole road to redemption that many never will. The majority could not. I illuminate it for all. I illuminate it for one. I illuminate it for one and all. I belong to no cult of rituals. I'm no artist with style. I am victim, victor, and voice. I am water flowing with my emotions flowing and following the tide of my experiences going where destiny dictates. The internet, social media are my oceans taking me and my emotions, my experiences to distant lands and foreign people telling my story, our story, far and wide, spreading truth, my truth, our truths across the globe, asking no, demanding, crying, who will answer the call for justice? Who will answer the call for justice? Who will answer? Who will answer? Will you? How can you answer the call for justice? What can you personally do? Where do you start and when? You start today. 
You start right now. Start today by merely caring and continue tomorrow by contributing in whatever capacity you are best suited. Ask questions. Ask questions. Ask questions. Adopt a prisoner. Join an advocacy group. Support PIN, incarcerated writers, and prison reform. Vote wisely. Vote wisely. Vote. 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 One answer does not fit all, and there are no wrong answers to spread my truth. Our truth, yes, but to get you to think, feel, and take action, any progressive action, that is climactic. Why of it all? His eyes and his eyes and my eyes are barcodes. I mean barred holes. I mean bars over hot coals stoked by badge mouths that form person but say property. Three times daily we stand and are inventoried, see our bodies accounted for, shaped into numbers. This name is not the one I started with. Six digits on an ID card, noosed around my neck for reminding. I'm a remainder. What's left after the stripped hole? Offender, 211819. The sum of its spilled parts, not equal, but less than. Leaving hurts the worst. Not me, but her, him, them, loves. Too swift exit after, our visits quick, quick hour. They re-enter their lives, soured prison sap, eyes wet with want, with wish, with hurt that whirs like the looped elegy made by the visiting room's metal door. I spent 90 cents on a 15 minute call to my brother. 90 cents on my friend. 40 cents for an email to auntie. Question, what is the rate per mile between loved ones? Answer, currency is a cell occupied or a body's weight in gold. Poetaster, a noun that means a person who writes inferior poetry. <laughs> w, I lead a monkish existence, every day in education in the ordinary. Whether these days are a series of accumulated moments or a single one continuously gifted from an inaccessible future, I cannot say. But I can say that writing is a form of meditation, communion between body and mind, a link between two worlds engendering spiritual refinement. As the poetaster in residence, at Eastern Correctional Facility, a Max B prison in upstate New York, resembling a castle surrounded by a moat of evergreens and no drawbridge, I've learned to accept the wind as my number one fan, my editor, publisher, and harshest critic, my everything and nothing. I wanted to put the pen down but my pen is a katana, severing every vein in the sky. I. For many aspiring poets, a rejection letter is a paper cut on their soul. For me, however, it's a blessing, and I have got hundreds. <laughs> the sting, no matter how minor, is an affirmation of my humanity a reminder that I'm alive, 
that the living see something of themselves reflected in my truth. They know what lies in the hearts of poets, those who the late C.D. Wright called, quote, the most stunned by existence, the most determined to redeem the world in words. If that's so, then I, too, am a cloudy mirror deserving of shine. I want to know what it's like to be free, to hurt and heal, to cut and bleed, if only in words. I want others to know that I'm human, that I'm not a monster, that I'm not another statistic, that I'm greater than my worst mistake. Anyone can change. We are not spiritually static creatures. We are beings of water and dust imbued with a wind spark, works in progress. Sometimes I don't know whether to laugh or cry or scream, so I do all three unashamed as a newborn. N. We tend to think of prisoners as those who wear jumpsuits and scowls, chips proudly displayed on their shoulders like military epaulets. We imagine them surrounded by miles and miles of razor wire, housed in concrete facades full of metal detectors, red eyes lowered, blades stashed in cheeks, ready for the yard, ready to devour the light of day. Americans, myself included, watch too much TV. <laughs> Our, quote, culture prefers fantasy over reality, ease over fact. Prison life, like most aspects of existence, is falsely portrayed in the media because the truth is less glamorous, less ratings friendly. It's easy to perpetuate a belief in the public and private, the us and them, to bury people alive and pretend that they're dead. Too easy. Family and friends once asked me if today's prison films and series accurately depict the world I live in. Yes, I told them with a grin, exactly unlike the world we live in. But they didn't seem to get it. They don't or won't understand how our worlds conflate. It makes them uneasy knowing, they're prisoner, knowing that there are prisoners to fear and complacency. They know this place has changed me, that their questions equal my answers, equal the truth, that I no longer know the luxury of ignorance, since the few things afforded me at commissary do not include bliss, hence the tenuousness of our connection. If, as they say, I'm lost, then I guess we're lost together, found together. D. These days I write and listen more than I laze and talk. Editors treat me with respect most of the time. I learn primarily through trial and error by sending my work through the literary kiln to measure its worth in the inferno of humanity's omnificence, which I imagine is the way wordsmiths, both past and future, have and will become masters of the language. As a citizen, you have to be brave to dream of being a writer. As a prisoner, you have to be crazy. <laughs> Though I cannot attend poetry readings or book release parties, I'm nevertheless grateful to be a part of this shared experience. I'm honored to receive encouragement from people who don't know me or owe me anything, yet for some reason feel the need to offer me a, quote, killer, their precious time, something I was too selfish to do prior to my incarceration. One day, perhaps soon, I'd like to do the same for others. Hopefully our paths will cross, intertwining like lightning, briefly, luminously, before heading in opposite directions with a newfound sense of purpose. Today, I offer myself to the wind, to whomever listens, hoping my story inspires others, authors of every ilk, quote, incarcerated or, quote, liberated, and honors the precious life I robbed as a man-child, which has since returned to the ether 
ensuring it was never in vain. Dear wind, trust me when I fall. Hold me like a raindrop in the cup of your palm to know once again the warmth of a woman, the joy of seasons changing, birthdays, weddings, and yes, funerals, public, private, you, me. What's the difference? Aren't we all the sum of our contradictions? People can pretend I'm dead, locked away in a castle, but I'm not. I'm here, breathing the same air as you, and besides air, there is nothing between us. Troy asked me today, so have you put any thought into what you want to do when you get out of here? I want to be a zero, no longer. Here in this life, we take showers, touch ourselves, eat fruit, and commit to letters. We dreamed of liquid swapping, we get off to echoes. My bones have become esoteric, inside this royal structure that builds pieces of our hunger. We open our mouths waiting for this sticky month to pass. We send fragments of desire, a holdover until we kiss, the pieces floating back to our electric core. I only play sports in which I feel like I might take off and fly. In recent years, I've conjured an airport, a liftoff point, where I make no ripple into the thick ground while we perform tiny murders of math mathematical inefficiencies. We spoke on the phone today for the first time. We've been in love for six months, give or take a year. Do you want me to call again? Should I? I did, not 10 minutes after we said I love you and bye. I wanted to tell you something, I ended up sending it in an email, but I still need to say, Maybe I just need that comfort sometimes, to know your voice is coming from a distance to speak with me. You come from me in a city where comfort comes with hidden costs, and now I am the one who fears your next email, wondering if it will be the kiss of death. Because when I called you back to tell you about infinity, the future past, everything in between, or whatever I would have spilled or blabbed about, you did not answer. So I wonder if you didn't want to hear me again yet. Or maybe you did, and you saw the missed call and felt anxious. Are we both anxious now? Is this what love and bondage does to young poets? I'm still navigating this, how to respect your boundaries while showing you that the greater portion of mine have crumbled for you. I mean, how far am I going when I say I'm yours? I'm just being true. And now, are you thinking of us like I am? Goodbye, I must go shower. Beg the water to drip down my back. Wondering if we think about similar things before we go to sleep. Right now in different parts of this vast country on the brink of madness. When another breathes on your stomach, I am not present and I am reminded of my past, which screams oblivion, my hands buried in pregnant thoughts of you. All of my poems, have folded away into the swollen humidity of July. All clouds, renegade verbs, unsung forms, let them sing, let us join them. can't express enough thanks to all of you for coming here today and sharing what we just heard. Big, big thanks for all of our performers. Thank you all.
I, I'm Robert Pollock. I'm the uh, prison writing coordinator. But I, before I get past the performer part, I just want to say it was really, I cherished the way you presenced the writers who weren't able to be here in the room. I, it was almost sacred and magical. Give one more hand for the performance. Um, I have a bunch of thanks I have to get through. Um, so there may be clapping sporadically. I'm just gonna rattle it off. You know, just keep it entertained. There needs to be some music. Just imagine there's a pulsing like dance beat in the background. Uh, I wanted to thank our interns, Giselle and Lisa, who <laughs> flipped the sign. Um, they were largely responsible for what you saw and heard today. They came up with the form of the show, chose the piece, helped edit and craft the books that you have in your hands. I hope everybody is thinking about what they want to write while I prattle to the people because we're depositing that in this box and that's going back to the writers in prison. Okay, more thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Emily Gallagher for stage managing and... Grace and Mayor, who are here for thank you for your help for coming. Um, Kim Chan, Chip Raleigh, and the entire World Voices Festival team. If you don't know, this is part of a week long series of awesomeness from all over the world. The same truth and justice is being, battles are being fought in stages all across this world. The, check it out, worldvoices.pen.org. It's awesome. More information's in the booklet. Uh, Big shout out to Drew, I see you in the back. The uh, Drew is uh, one of our brilliant Penn colleagues who helped run Penn America's uh, fight for free speech and freedom of expression. And of course, to all of our uh, incredible writers. Okay, two final things. Um, drop your stuff off, that's one, That's don't count that one. And then uh, we have the 2018 Prison Writing Awards Anthology, which is a collection of our winning work from our prison writing contest. It's available for 10 bucks, it's over there. That money helps fund the next round of anthology and writing work in the program. And come and say hello to our performers and everyone here, and thank you for coming out. Give yourselves a hand, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much.